Okay, good day everybody. I hope that you can all hear me. Um, we'll start the session now. It is being recorded, so it will be up on YouTube. Having problems with the mouse. Uh, it will be up on YouTube in a couple of weeks' time. And so uh, the link is in the email that I sent around earlier. So I just want to uh, ask you, please keep your mics muted and we can unmute them at the end for any questions or put your questions in the chat and we can ask those. Uh, you can turn your uh, camera off if you would like, because this, this recording does go up onto YouTube, so you might want to. Um, and thank you very, very much to Sandy Thomas and to Christy Harper for joining me in this presentation uh, to give you a bit more information about the changes with the WA Postwar Guidelines. So today I'm just going to provide an overview of the, the, the recent review and the purpose of these guidelines really is just to prevent and reduce the risk of further falls and injury from falls. We want to detect that early clinical de deterioration because that gives a better outcome for the patient and also promote well-being and the multidisciplinary team falls management care. It also helps to provide the professionals with very clear best practice guidelines and it optimises care and patient safety and it does standardise it to a, to a degree. But they are guidelines so they can be adapted. So what's the history of these guidelines? Well, back in 2011, 2012, uh, Sir Charles Gardner actually had a, quite a nasty um, incident and a review of that indicated that we needed more clear guidance on post-fall care. And that's when we developed these guidelines, we took them up to uh, Nick Waldron, who was then the state lead for falls, and he adopted them for WA. They've been reviewed in 2018 and just recently last year. They are multidisciplinary. Initially, it was just nursing, OT, physio and medical. Uh, in 20, the 2018 version is recommended for use in residential care by the world guidelines. In 2018, 2019, we added pharmacy into the disciplines. And this year we have added interprofessional assessment We've expanded the definition, provided further resources. And 2025, you're very welcome to send in uh, any ideas that you have, but we are considering inclusion of injuries and how to get um, a patient off the floor if they have an injury. The overview of the process, it was a small review uh, basically because of system constraints. You know, we were still in a pandemic at that point. The call went out via the COP and then via um, every distribution list that I could find for uh, working group members, public and private. And we review the guideline as a whole, but then we formed subgroups and there were identified leads for those subgroups. So Sandy was the identified lead for physio and Christy for OT. We looked at, uh, we got experts. We got expert consultation for, sorry, for medical and pharmacy. We did a literature search, so we updated all of the evidence. We did a state consultation survey for the penultimate uh, version of the guidelines. We looked at all of the feedback in the comments and made um, the various updates that were required. It was endorsed then through the Old Adult Health Network and through the West Australian Falls Prevention Special Interest Group and has now been published uh, onto the web. The definition has been updated, so most of us use the World Health Organization uh, definition, but we have also included all syncopal events, controlled falls, rolls out of bed, and if the patient is suspected of having put themselves on the floor. You all know this pathway, you will recognize this pathway. 
it's generally nurses that uh, do the vast majority of this pathway, but also the coordination of. What's new on that pathway is the patient on a palliative care pathway. It was hidden in the 2018 uh, guidelines, so we've brought it out so that everybody is aware of it, and that's uh, uh, gone into the process. And then goals of care check, we felt it was important that this had to occur um, at the point of a fall. So looking at medical, minimal changes have been made. Uh, for imaging, we follow the National Institute for Healthcare and Excellence guidelines, uh, which have been developed for emergency departments. They do provide very useful criteria and we've found them to be helpful with all areas, so secondary and acute uh, hospitals. The resources have been updated to include uh, a medical post-fall assessment pro forma and uh, I'll probably go into, into that in a moment. This is what it looks like. Sorry, it might not be very clear on your screen, but it is in the guidelines. Uh, what we have found is that if a medical officer completes the medical pro forma, uh, he generally is 100% likely to meet best practice compared with around 33% if he does not complete this, this document. So it is a worthwhile tool. Sandy, over to you. Um, can you hear me, Sue? Is that on the mic yep. on? Oh, yep, good. we can hear you. Um, yes. So first, I just want to thank Sue for actually all the hard work she did with the guidelines and coordinating quite a number of um, representatives to actually um, update the guidelines. Um, and then we had a physio working group that I would just like to thank Lisa Campbell and Maddie Rangai, also from Fiona Stanley, Elvin from Rockingham. And then we had some others, um, Jess Chappelle and um, Jess Davies, who are also um, on the physiotherapy working group. Um, so giving us a broader perspective across different health sites. So overall, when we actually looked at the guidelines, one of the gaps that we found in the physio section, it was quite um, a mix. The, it wasn't clear what was um, had to be very, um, what specifically was there for the subjective and the objective assessment. So if, it is a little bit prescriptive, um, but hoping that it's more comprehensive. So we've updated, um, so in the guidelines, there's a very clear subjective of what questions you need to ask as well as objective. Um, we've tried to be very clear about the comprehensive physio assessment of what's included. I know from um, doing our audits here at Fiona Stanley and the others commented on the same is people are not sure what a comprehensive physio assessment is and it's not just merely a mobility assessment. Um, so we're hoping that physiotherapists can do a more detailed assessment um, really outlining what the risk is um, um, of why they're falling. Um, and then of course we did, as Sue mentioned, we had the World Falls Guideline being released in um, late last year. So there was some lovely uh, grade 1A evidence, um, which was the gate speed, which I'll talk about in the next slide. We did a reference update of up-to-date references, including things like the up-to-date um, World Ford Guidelines with um, what best to use as falls risk assessments. Um, so the appendix, we updated the falls cue card and we actually spent quite a bit of time updating the ISOBAR as well as in, adding in a SOE air as well. If people preferred that, it's really a, a site preference or a person preference. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in the next slides. We have kept the review still within two working days, but the, if a uh, first particular site want, wants to do it within tw um, 24 um, hours, like ours at Fiona Stanley, where we do have a 20, a seven day a week service, um, but across the state where physios do not always work um, on the weekends, it's um, still within the two working days. Thanks, Sue. So did you want um, the next slide? Are you able to put that up? Thanks. I haven't. Is it, is it popped up, Sue? The next slide hasn't popped up. Yes, should have done. Yep, Pop now it has. Yep, that's yep. good. It was just a bit slow yes. on this end. So this is with the comprehensive physio objective assessment that we're trying to be a little bit more prescriptive, but hoping not taking away from um, actually thinking about what is that person's individual falls risk assessment. So we want to ensure that postural BPs were included because very often postural hypertension um, is a cause of fall if that's a likely cause. So just um, making sure people think about it. 
actually including cognition as large proportion of our um, population that do have falls do have cognition um, cognitive impairment um, yes definitely a mobility assessment um, and then again with the mobility assessment to include um, the amount of assistance required as well as any aids that are required um, if possible, we we would like a balance assessment, even if it's a basic static and standing balance um, assessment, and if not, a sitting assessment. And that's all more clearly detailed in the actual guideline itself. And this is where we actually, the, as, is looking at what is the falls risk and doing outcome measures. So is it is it muscle weakness, doing manual muscle testing? Is it a vestibular issue? Um, so the next dot point, so interesting enough, what came up in the World Falls Guideline is looking at gait speed, which is a new one. It'll be interesting to see if any health sites are using it, where it's a quick and easy test and can be done on the wards, is actually just looking at gait speed merely over four metres at their normal walking pace, as well as with their normal aids. And if it's less than 0 0.8 metres per second, um, there are falls risk. So, and that evidence is really quite high as well. Um, and interesting at grade one B is also came up with the world fall the falls guidelines is the timed up and go um, to use that as well. Um, so the SOPIAs and the so um, so it's actually an ISA bar that we've actually as well as the SOIA that we've put into the new guideline. The previous guideline had it in a, a PDF, so it was just the, a PDF without um, the header of, uh, of one of the health sites. So we've done it in a table form. So if you are using it at a site that, use pa that uses paper-based notes, you can actually just print it out onto a UA, uh, um, some note paper with your site's UMRN really easily and write into it. Or you can actually just use the headings, take away the table, which is what we've done at Fiona Stanley, where we are um, have electronic e-notes. And um, I've advised staff just to copy and paste the headers and then fill and then fill it in. So trying to eliminate eliminate um, missing bits and pieces as well, so they actually fully understand everything that needs to be looked at when you're assessing. But trying also not to be prescriptive in that you can actually think about what is the falls risks and what are the interventions. Thanks, Sue. And then the next one is just really the um, lanyard as well, which follows um, on from our having a, a good subjective as well as objective as well um, and some interventions there. So we've, by all means, the health sites can copy and um, make their own little um, laminated lanyards to put on your badges as well. Thanks, um, Sue. Thank you very much, Sandy. Well, uh, I'm sure there'll be a few questions a bit later. So yeah. now I just would like to introduce uh, Christy, who's just going to talk about the OT changes. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. Again, uh, yes, thank you to, to Sue for getting us all organised and to um, the OT working group. We had a great group from across the state. So we had Carly and Prue and Penn and Ashley from you know, Stanley Hospital. We had Ashley and Catherine um, and Samantha from across um, WAX and Nikki from um, Charlie's um, Osmond Park as well. So this was really just to highlight that the occupational therapy role still um, highlights or targets the core OT areas um, in relation to fall. So we still continue to look at that. Um, force risk factors and how that impacts on activities of daily living, including the impact of vision. We focus on cognition and how that um, might increase a patient's force risk factors and look at the environment and how it's set up and how we can um, best support our patients. Um, so we still continue, continue to see patients within two working days. Um, where possible, we did add in this time that these reviews can take place in person or via remote review on telehealth. And that was especially to um, support those working out in WAX, but also it was part of the um, pandemic then as well. Uh, referral process hasn't really changed. We just added in uh, via e-referrals because it's a method that um, some of the sites were now using. Post-fall assessment, essentially um, it's unchanged. We still complete our falls analysis. We need to identify all those false risk factors. But what we did add in is the stratification. 
So it's about um, actually looking at which false risk factors are modifiable. So which ones can we actually change? And then, um, you know, understanding the patient's goals um, and looking at, um, you know, the top two to three um, priorities that we can actually impact on and add value to for that patient. So it's, it's really just about um, setting a plan which aims to um, target the most important factors for that patient. In terms of the interventions, uh, we completed a literature review to have a look at what was um, best practice. Um, so the reference lists have been updated. Um, and what we have added to the intervention is that all patients and their carers should be provided with written and verbal tailored falls prevention education. So this is uh, now in the World Falls Guideline. Um, it's in a couple of the last Cochrane reviews as well. Um, from different settings. So it's really about um, providing patients with um, education that meets their needs, but also giving that to them in a written format. Um, we know that it supports their recall of the education that we have provided. We've also added in the need to consider our post-discharge needs and outpatient referrals. Um, we often only see patients on a one-off basis sometimes. So it's really about um, making sure that patients receive that um, post-discharge care to address false risk factors which can take um, more input. And it's, we've just brought the interventions in line with the world guidelines. Okay. Uh, so OT um, continues to have the appendices, um, appendices which have the tables where we've outlined the risk factors. Um, and then specific OT specific um, interventions. Um, so these I know are used quite a lot by our staff, um, but in terms of the different areas, they're broken up into ADLs, vision, um, environment, cognition. Uh, for ADL, we've added in uh, the risk factors of postural hypertension um, because we know it's uh, something that's very common and we need to focus on this um, and the impact of high risk medications, medication changes, especially in the acute setting. In terms of um, changes to the interventions, we've added in the provision of um, like small aids, also recognising hospital functional decline. So um, just recognising that we need to keep patients as um, and to maintain their function as best we can. So it's really looking at not restricting up activity, it's about supporting their function as much as we can. Obviously, providing that written and verbal education, and because some sites now have the FRAMP and don't have the FRAMP, we've removed reference to that as well. In terms of vision, there's no changes to the risk factors, um, but under the OT specific intervention, it's really reinforcing the use and availability of own sensory aids, which was um, missing. In terms of occupational therapy and cognition, uh, we added in the risk factor of alcohol-related brain impairment. Um, we've also added in the um, text here in bold, so using the sunflower tool, which is more common, providing that written education. And as highlighted in the world um, guidelines, it's about addressing fears of fall, fear of falling as well. So post-fall is a good time to be able to, is to look at a patient's fear of falling consider the need for further assessment and um, some of the tools outlined in the guideline and providing that intervention and follow-up care. In terms of the environment, we've added in use of unfamiliar um, equipment, which is often common in hospital. So they might be using a commode rather than toilet frame, for example. Um, in terms of the OT specific interventions, it was really um, you know, adding in these two, um, ensuring appropriate uh, setup in the room and removing unnecessary pieces of equipment or clutter. And we just added some more specifics in there regarding um, checking the heights of equipment. Uh, documentation um, was just specified to make sure we had minimum documentation requirements because we acknowledge that different sites are using different types of documentation. So it's about setting out the minimum requirements um, which are outlined there. Or additionally, we have um, provided an ISO bar example. Um, so at Charlie's and Osborne Park, we're using this in a sticker format, but it could be used online um, depending on what the site requirements are. So it's just, yeah, moving our documentation into um, that ISO bar format. 
and I'll hand you back to Sue. Thank you very much, Chrissy. Thank you. Okay, so uh, talking about pharmacy now, and I'm not sure if there's any pharmacists online, so I might skip through it fairly quickly. Um, but we updated it to include a lot more relevant detail. Uh, so if you are a pharmacist, you do need to go in and have a look. The review is still within two working days and they want to look at the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic um, mediation interactions that contribute to false risk and the appropriateness of the medication and also what the comprehensive medication review should actually include. Moving to the resources that are in the appendix, so appendix five is pharmacy, and we have included the MFRAT, which is a medication related false risk assessment tool, and it enables the categorization of false risk um, that's related to medication use, and some actions, recommended actions to be considered. There's also a complete list of uh, the common false risk increasing drugs, so the FRITs, uh, they are listed and there are links as well. Uh, we looked at uh, the, the world guidelines, obviously they were published in September last year, so uh, as a group we looked at what we could take from the recommendations that potentially could be implemented across the state and both Sandy and uh, Christy have uh, talked about some of those that they have adopted. Uh, with the pharmacy, we've adopted the STOP4 uh, uh, tool, which uh, screens uh, for de-prescribing, it's about de-prescribing. And essentially, you, um, you, it is an actual tool, you go in, you put your medication in, and it will su suggest whether it should be de-prescribed, and then it will also then suggest an alternative. So it's, uh, it's quite a useful tool to use. Anybody could use that. So if you have a concern uh, and you're working remotely, then you can go in and use this stopful tool and then um, escalate it to medical staff. Uh, it was developed through the Delphi process, which if you've read the world guidelines, you'll know that that's a very comprehensive process. And uh, there is a list of 12 categories of medication that are also provided for deep prescribing. So it is all there. Not only you can go online or you can go to uh, Appendix 5 and you can find all the information there that you need. So it will say if you've got benzos, um, false risk assessment, in which cases should you consider withdrawal and it will identify those cases uh, is a withdrawal period, a stepwise withdrawal period required, it will tell you that, and then it will say what to monitor after you've started to de-prescribe. So all of that is in, in the appendix. Moving to community, and I have to uh, acknowledge Tony Petter and uh, his community working group uh, for developing this. I do know that there was a lot of uh, work went into this and uh, Tony restyled it completely and I mean it's fabulous. Um, so that is also available on the WA Health uh, Post for website. The interprofessional post for assessment, I'll get Sandy to talk some more about that at, at, at the end, but uh, it's based on the Fiona Stanley model and it's the provision of interprofessional team-based care to deliver an efficient and coordinated service to patients. So essentially um, an OT will do both the physio and the OT role. Um, training um, occurs both ways uh, and there are guidelines and an ISA bar to complete. I said there is a specific website for this information so you can go there or you can send me an email and I'll send you all the information that uh, you require. The other appendices that are involved, um, they include definitions um, and are worth going and having a look at uh, clinical incident investigation along with a template, um, post fall multidisciplinary huddles or safety huddles, so a lot more information and tools uh, available there. 
and then suggested questions for auditing for all, all disciplines. Uh, the WA Health posts all management website. There is education there for all of the disciplines and also for the overall process. There's consumer advice resources and obviously the link to the interprofessional post for assessment. The next review will start in 2025, uh, 2026, and a survey, it will be a big one. It'll be a big review. Uh, a survey will be sent out prior calling for uh, feedback and then also asking who would like to be part of the working group uh, reviewing the guidelines. The first review we did, we had 55 members. Uh, this review we did, I think we had 22, something like that so it was much smaller but um, would expect it to be back up in the 50s again for the next time. I have to acknowledge you can't I'm hoping you can see those names on your on your um, screen. Um, I just want to acknowledge absolutely every single one of the working group. Uh, I'm not going to name you all uh, but you're all absolutely fantastic to work with. The passion for patient safety and force management and for creating something that can be used across the state in as many sectors as possible. It was just wonderful, wonderful um, working with you. So thank you very much because I know the process frustrated all of us at times, but we got there and I think that we should be very, very proud of what we have created and delivered. Uh, if you can uh, whip your phones out and do your QR reader at that uh, QR code, I'd be extremely grateful if you could give a feedback on uh, this presentation. If you want a PDF of the presentation, please either email myself or this email address down here. Um, and we will send it to you. Right, thank you. Any questions? Bedside. I was going to stop the recording.